welcome. I'm Jeff Resnick. I'm Chief of the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you for joining us today as we continue our 2022 series of all virtual National Library of Medicine History Talks. For those of you on Twitter, thank you for following along using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. And to those of you who wish to share questions with our speaker this afternoon, or in this case this evening, please use the live feedback button you see under your video stream. NLM History Talks promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public service in the fields of biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. It also re reflects the commitment of our library to foreground the voices of people of color, women, and individuals of a variety of cultural and disciplinary backgrounds, all who value these collections and use them to advance their research, their teaching, and their learning. We supplement NLM History Talks with speaker interviews on our blog called Circulating Now, located at circulatingnow.nlm.nih.gov. And I'll add that NLM History Talks are made possible by an outstanding team here at the National Library of Medicine and at the video casting unit of the National Institutes of Health. And I want to thank each and every one of the members of that, those, this great team for their time and their talent in bringing this program to you, the public. Today, I have the great pleasure and privilege of introducing Dr. John Matthew of Korea University in India, where he is Associate Professor of the History of Science, Humanities, and Social Sciences and Sciences. He joined the faculty at Korea in early 2019, following his time at the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research in Pune in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Dr. Matthew has taught previously at Harvard University, the University of Massachusetts, Duke and Duke University. With bachelor's, master's, and MPhil degrees in zoology from the Madras Christian College in Chine in Madras, and it, this is located in India's southern state of Tamil Nadu, he holds uh, an additional master's degree in medical anthropology from Harvard University and two doctorates, one in ecological sciences from Old Dominion University in Virginia, and the other in the history of science from Harvard University. Dr. Matthew's instructional experience is very impressive. It includes anthropology, biology, geology, history, and the history of science. At Korea University, he has co-taught foundational courses in the first year, including scientific reasoning and exploring the social and the historical, the latter of which he is co-leading again this particular term. He is also currently teaching a course entitled Life at Different, at Different Scales in the Biological Sciences, in which discipline he's also been responsible for a co-taught course on evolution and the history of biology. And the history of biology course is cross-listed with history and psychology. Dr. Matthew's affiliations do not lie with biology alone, but also with the field of history, particularly economic history, and the environmental sciences, past, present, and predicted environments, and environmental history uh, courses he's uh, cross-listed with the field of history. He is delighted to have the opportunity finally to teach one of his favorite courses in an upcoming term, which he has led previously at Harvard and at the Indian Institute of Science Education Research, uh, Science History, and Theater. Dr. Matthew's interests are fundamentally and quite obviously wonderfully cross-disciplinary. He retains a deep interest in theater and music, both of which he, uh, he brought into conversation uh, with his own research in the writing and the performance of a musical at the Institute of Science Education Research entitled The Sun Was White, The Moon Disobedient. This was with students of the Institute mainly. He also founded and directed the Institute's choir there, where he uh, has also, which he's also done at the University of Korea, helping to helm a 2019 production of A Christmas Carol from both a theatrical and a choral perspective. Dr. Matthew is in the process of revising a book-length manuscript entitled To Fashion a Fauna for British India. He's also actively researching the plague and influenza epidemics in India in the 1890s and in 1918-1919, respectively. And this is, in, uh, this is a considerable part of the subject of his talk today here with us at the National Library of Medicine. So I thank you for joining us and please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew 
here to the National Library of Medicine virtually to speak on socio-cultural responses within India during times of pandemic disease. Dr. Matthew, over to you, and thank you so much for making the time to join us today and for what I'm sure will be a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeff Resnick. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay Franz, for all that you have done. It is a real joy to be here and uh, to be able to speak to you today. Um, my talk is titled, as you can see, Sociocultural Responses Within India During Times of Pandemic Disease. And I share this effort with my collaborators, Ishita Pradeep, Kartika Satinarayan, uh, Lippi Savita, and Rutuja Rukri. I would also like to thank uh, at Korea University, Arya Lavka, who with uh, Lippi Savita came up with the germ of this particular topic, to Mary Sears at um, Harvard University, who has helped us considerably with backing resources and a number of people that essentially have given me and given us a number of tips with regard to particular deities. And I thank particularly Mr. P. Vijay Kumar, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Srajana Kaikini, and also Professor Aishwarya. Um, Right. When the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, called on the citizenry of India to cheer medical practitioners on the front lines by beating pots and pans for a period of half an hour on the 21st of March 2020, there was a section of the populace that was unimpressed by these uh, percussive plaudits. Some dismissed it as a publicity stunt. Others suggested that the undertones were grim, drawing upon Hindu cosmic connections. Fact or fallacy, the next few days would see the onset of a lockdown that night itself, impassable state borders, and long caravans of migrant labourers, euphemistically called guest workers, trying to get home to distant states in what was one of the largest internal migrations worldwide. Next slide, please. Um, also a feature of earlier pandemics, particularly the plague in Bombay in 1896. In today's talk, I shall, on behalf of my collaborators as well, seek to place in context responses at a social and a cultural level to our current crisis with those of earlier pandemics, with disproportionate reference to the period between 1817, the outbreak of the cholera epidemic, and 1942, the petering out of the plague in the southern Indian city of Coimbatore. In so doing, we shall be examining those diseases that assume pandemic proportions, in particular, cholera, the plague, and influenza, as well as refer to others that range in overall effect from the endemic to the epidemic, such as smallpox. Such an investigation will involve both local practice and tradition, where religious belief, considered by non-participants and some elements of exercise, superstition, uh, comes to the fore. For a comparison of the 1896 plague and the 1918 influenza, often known as the Great Influenza, or more pejoratively, the Spanish flu, our major source of information for India would include the influential work of David Arnold and Chinmay Tumbe, the first through a persuasive article called Disease, Rumour and Panic in India's Plague and Influenza Epidemic that appeared in the Robert Peckham edited volume, Empires of Panic, Epidemics and Colonial Anxieties in 2015. The second, a book titled um, uh, The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920, How They Shaped India and the World that was published in 2020. Um, through this talk, we shall be drawing upon images and records found in the digital collections of the National Library of Edison 
and we hasten to thank the library for the considerable access that it has so generously afforded us, even as we applaud it for its far sight in undertaking the lecture series of which today's effort is a part. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Chimmy Thumbe uh, has given us this, and I use it largely as uh, as a quick heuristic to point to what exactly happened between 1817 and 1920, including the onset of the cholera pandemic, the International Sanitary Conference held in Constantinople, now Istanbul, um, the, um, the first two being held in Paris, uh, the third plague pandemic, and then the influenza pandemic, um, 1894 in Hong Kong, and 1896 in India onwards for into the 1940s, although it was mostly done by 1925. However, we start with cholera, our first focal point, which appears to be by far the most represented in the online collections of the library. Next slide, please. Um, in this particular um, in this particular set of slides, we have mainly offerings from the 1860s and the 1870s, from one, with one from 1913, and I draw your attention to them largely because they speak about a number of things. One, you have such elements as cholera spasmodica, the, the manner in which you had mild to extreme forms where there would be vomiting and purging and the like. And uh, that's what it was called at that point. There's a natural history of cholera by Joseph Ferrer, which is interesting because Ferrer was in India for a long time and wrote a tremendous tome on the Thanatophidia of India, which include venomous snakes at a point when snake bite uh, from venomous snakes was also considered a disease. And we also have the work of Sir Leonard Rogers, who was a pioneer in the field of the study of cholera in India and even contributed to, um, to, the, Indian National, to the Indian Science Congress uh, speaking about cholera in this particular in, in its very early years. Uh, next slide, please. In this 1880 slide on the left, what you do have is um, a map, a cholera map of India, and what you do see is that the dark part is in the northeast, and that's that's significant because it was from there over 60 years prior that cholera had moved, was believed to have moved out from the region of Calcutta and then went on to other parts of the world and that is still largely held uh, through Russia, eventually making its way to the United States before that other parts of Europe and the like. On the right, what we have is a well and a privy and the proximity of it essentially suggests that these are remarkably insalubrious circumstances and unsanitary, which may have contributed to the spread of the disease, it being largely waterborne. Now, when we say that cholera is disproportionately represented, this isn't surprising, given that from the point of view of meticulously recorded pandemics in the country, it is the earliest. We did say 1817. Now, from Bundelkhand, the region now shared by the north central Indian states of Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, a diary report on the 14th of November from the then Governor General Francis Rawdon Hastings, the Marquis of Hastings, uh, 1754 to 1826. While involved in military activity leading up to the Third Anglo Maratha War, pointed to the number of losses that his men were sustaining from the disease. 97 deaths are reported to me as having occurred during yesterday forenoon. 
there is an opinion that the water of the tanks, the only water which we have in this place, may be unwholesome and add to the disease. Therefore, I must march tomorrow so as to make the Pahuj River, though I must provide carriage for 1006. Sixth, cholera provoked tremendous fear in the local populace. Nearly 200 years after Hastings' observations, Dr. Y.B. Satinarayana wrote in a memoir of his own grandfather needing to bury his parents himself, dying soon after the same disease. As Dr. Satinarayana writes, in those days, infectious diseases were widespread in villages, particularly in untouchable dwellings. Cholera was one such disease. Each house had at least a couple of deaths due to cholera. People called this dreadful disease gatara, and were even afraid of touching the dead body of a person who had died of the disease. Only the inmates of the house could carry the dead body for cremation. Now the next slide, please. These are estimates from Zimbabwe of pandemic deaths, um, the for cholera pandemic deaths. Then what you can see is the countries that were largely affected. India, where it was an epidemic, and what the percentages were by 1870, 3.2. Some places were far worse. Egypt, for example, um, and um, also Russia and Spain. Um, but this is just to point to the fact that it was significant. It touched a considerable number of places in the world through much of the 19th century, and in some ways foreshadowed what would come through other diseases. Also in mind that this was a time uh, 1870 when germ theory was just about starting to be this discussed something that would be much better known by the time the plague came around in the 1890s. Now, a number of epidemiological considerations characterize a study of cholera, including John Snow's seminal work in London in 1854, and the continued battle between the acolytes of sanitation versus those of contagion. But these have been discussed severally and elsewhere. What is staggering is the number of deaths across the 19th and early 20th centuries that accrued to the disease, where India was seen as a source. Now, for a discussion on the plague and the great influenza, our point of departure is David Arnold's thoughtful 2015 paper, an archival research undertaken by some of us in the Maharashtra State Archives. We also draw upon the holdings of the Indian Medical Gazette, made available to us through PubMed, to which we could gain access thanks to the National Library of Medicine. The Great Influenza arguably took anywhere between 10.5 and 20 million Indian lives, the latter date occurring in Thumbay's estimation and a number of other people, including John Barry in 2004, between late 18, 1918 and mid-1919, based upon different estimates yet remains curiously understudied in the South Asian context, against other largely reported instances as the Bombay Plague of the late 1890s and early 1900s, and the Bengal Famine of the early 1940s. While using the plague in Bombay as a point of comparison with the flu, we focus closely on events that occurred in 1918 and 1919 in Bombay itself, drawing directly upon the holdings of the Maharashtra State Archives Rather than enter a debate about statistics of mortality across the, quarter, uh, across the subcontinent on account of the epidemic, the pandemic, we draw attention to the fact that even as daily mortalities beggared the normal rate of death in a proportion of 18 to 1 on occasion, figures that have become frighteningly familiar in our recent crisis, the ravages of influenza and the waning days of the Great War occasioned a fairly muted societal response in Bombay in contradistinction to the experiences of the previous epidemic, that of the plague, which excited so much animosity against the colonial government uh, within the local population. In so doing, we hope to indicate that an already embattled populace in the wake of previous and competing disease, including cholera and malaria, 
and in the context of a more global cataclysm, had developed its own sense of inurement to yet another destructive force, even one with as wide a range of grim reaping as that of the Spanish flu. J.A. A. Martin, writing in the latter part of 1918, visited almost every portion of the country and wiped out in a few months practically the whole natural increase in the population for the previous seven years, so Martin states, right, which is what influence I did. Our own work in the Maharashtra State Archives attests to this loss. If I could have the next slide, please. Now, uh, these are taken from the work of Patterson Pyle, uh, The Geographic Immortality of the 1918 Influenza pa Pandemic, in the Bulletin of the History of Medicine. And what you can see is that it wasn't that severe. This happened largely in the... This happened um, in March, April 1918, going on to May. Um, ostensibly in the United States around Kansas. At the same time, it was taken to eastern China and had reached neutral Spain. And uh, it was, however, next slide, please. It was, however, in the second wave from August, September, October, November, that mayhem ruled. And that's when... Um, and this is largely to do with moving troops and in places like Vest and uh, in Senegal, uh, Boston had a fair bit as well. And uh, troops were coming back to uh, their home countries by November at the end, uh, after the 11th of November, at the end of the First World War. And uh, that included India, uh, where Soldiers had fought in a number of theatres, including in East Africa, in France, in Flanders, in Palestine, in, in Mesopotamia, in Persia. And they came back, and they came back to Bombay. And they went through Bombay towards places like Pune. A number of what were called the martial races went back towards Punjab. And then things went completely out of whack. The next slide, please. Now, these are files from the Maharashtra State Archive. You can see the name Influenza on it. And if I could have the next slide, please. Now, this is in Pune, which is in the Bombay Presidency. And you can read it immediately that says, the death rate in Pune is very severe. On the 27th instant, it was 201. This is a picture of the King Edward Memorial Hospital doubling its beds. And uh, some places it's subsiding, like Lunabla and Kid, but is very severe in another part of what is now the Pune district, which is Baramathi. This is the collector of Pune. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is this particular uh, file from the, from the archives is from a, a part of Maharashtra, which is south of Pune in Sholapur. And it's curiously worded and yet makes the point very grimly. Next slide, please. Where the, where the collector writes that he has the honor to report that Sholapur is suffering from a very severe epidemic of influenza. Uh, Apart from everything else, working at half the machinery, the, the key point of it here is the death rate, usually about 10 per day, rose to 180 yesterday. And pretty much everyone's being hit, the district charge, the civil surgeon, the railway staff, and there it is. Next slide, please. We say in continuation of my letter, I have the honour to report the deaths in Shalopur to Town had been 180, 176, and 241. The last figure represents an annual death rate of about 950 to 1,000 uh, by 1,000. And I think that this is, these were staggering numbers when we encountered them in the archive. And suddenly, 
they made sense when COVID hit. And that's something which really brings to, to the fore what the sense of staggering loss was at that point in time. Next slide, please. Now, David Arnold writes, in 1896 to 1897, India was struck by the bubonic plague, part of the third global pandemic that began in southern China and Hong Kong in 1894, and which over the following 50 years resulted in an estimated 10 to 15 million deaths worldwide, 12 million of them in India alone. Even before India had fully recovered from this catastrophe, it was hit by a second and still more destructive disease. The influenza outbreak of 1918 to 19 has been described as the greatest pandemic in world history, leaving in its wake 30 million dead. According to official statistics, influenza resulted in 12.5 million deaths in India, a figure that has subsequently been revised upwards to 18 or even 20 million. Now, these numbers are widely discrepant. There are other figures that suggest that 50 to 100 million people died worldwide. but even if we go at the mean of, say, uh, 10.5 to 20 in India, which is about 15 or 16 at this point in time, just in India alone, the number of mortalities uh, were greater than all losses due to uh, uh, sustained uh, due to battle in the First World War. And that is very telling. Uh, next slide, please. And yet, and this is key, where plague provi provoked full-scale panic, caused riots and incited state repression, a greater and more temporally concentrated mortality of the influenza epidemic gave rise to abundant rumour, but otherwise passed without any major panic or upheaval. So why, in terms of panic reactions, was the influenza epidemic, to paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark, or in Silver Blaze, what would be called the Curious Case of the Dog in the Night Time, which was picked up later by Mark Haddon for his own book. Could we go to the next slide, please? In Pune, on the Ganesh Kind Road, a major thoroughfare of the city, there is the Chapeka Memorial uh, for three brothers. Um, and they are treated as national heroes in, in Pune, in many ways. The reason that they are so venerated is because they were responsible for the assassination of the then plague commissioner, Walter Rand. And Walter Rand was particularly zealous in his duties, and the Chaffaker brothers uh, were decided to take it into their own hands to rid their city of the of this blight in, the, in, the, in, in terms of this person, because there were quarantines being effectuated, people being taken out of their homes, not heard of for a while, and rumour was rife. Now, in the next slide, next slide, please. This, these are two pages from Kalpish Ratna's quarantine papers. If you look at the bottom uh, paragraph on the left, he will say, for God's sake, Ruthen, don't you know any history? The Chaffaker brothers murdered the British plague commissioner, Walter Rand. Rand's extremism was merely an excuse for a larger political agenda, of course. And so it goes on. Uh, next uh, slide, please. The quarantine papers are written by Kalpa Shratna, uh, which is an amalgamation of two names, Kalpana Swaminathan and Ishrat Syed, both doctors who have spent a great deal of time in the self-same archives, the Maharashtra State Archives, and used a number of documents directly in trying to uncover the story of plague in their home city of Bombay. Next slide, please. And over here, you've got a memorandum of the plague, which is taken directly from there where uh, quarantine measures are really being discussed. And this is signed by a number of people, both British and Indian, because little choice was seen in the matter in terms of trying to uh, rid the city of this, of this plague that had hit it. 
And one of the key elements of that uh, of, of, of social response at this time was that many just fled the city, a situation that repeated itself with the with the COVID outbreak, with as we saw earlier, guest workers, migrant workers just trying to get home. Next slide, please. This is from the National Library of Medicine's holding, and you have this picture of victims being carried through the streets of Bombay. And this was a sadly familiar sight in many ways. Um, this one is uh, undated, uh, but tells the story emphatically. Next slide, please. One of the major figures in dealing with the plague was a man uh, called Valdemar Hufkin, a Ukrainian bacteriologist, Jewish, who had come to India and had helped uh, very much with the cholera outbreak, with the cholera outbreak in Calcutta, and so was invited to come to Bombay, where uh, he rendered yeoman service in this particular regard. And the next slide, please. Uh, shows another book by Kalpesh Ratna, which tells the story of Room 000, which was, it was called, which, uh, where much of this work was done, uh, first in the Brant Medical College, which you see on the top, and uh, la and later what would be in you know, the governor's house, what's called saint Pere, and now is known as the Hafkin Institute. The map below shows the part of Bombay that was really hit, particularly the centre, and uh, over there, which is where the work was done, all the way down to the south, towards what is now known, what which is called Kalaba, Kalaba Island, which is where, close to where you would have ships coming in to the harbour and where outbreaks would occur. Next slide, please. Now we have uh, in this slide Kirsata Shuhasburo and Alexander Yassin, and both of whom were co-credited with discovering the the causative organism for the plague. Uh, Kittisacha got there first, although the actual discovery is largely uh, credited to Yersin. Uh, Kittisacha saw organisms which may not have been the bacilli that Yersin saw, and history is borne out in the fact that what was called pastoral pestis is now called Yersinia pestis. Next slide, please. Now, the timeline of events in the 1890s was that Hafkin came in 1893, as I mentioned earlier. The plague broke out in Hong Kong in 1894 with a fear that it might reach India. And Hafkin was enlisted for help for the plague in 1896. Yersin, who had come up, uh, who had uh, concocted his own particular uh, counteract, so to speak, came to Bombay, but his serum didn't work, and so he left. At the same time, there was an emergency meeting in Venice that threatened an embargo of goods from India, which had huge economic implications, the result of which was the passing of the Epidemic Diseases Act in 1897, an act that was indeed invoked for the COVID-19 uh, outbreak as well. So some laws have long shadows. Next slide, please. Now, the features of the Epidemic Diseases Act were to authorize health officials to confiscate or destroy any property, permit the hospitalization and segregation of suspected plague victims, allow rapid disposal of the dead, and institute systematic inspection of travelers by road, rail, and sea with the possibility of detention. Rand really prosecuted the last one greatly, and that is what largely contributed to his somewhat precipitate demise early. Next slide, please. Now, during the plague, there were a number of sources of panic. One were top down, the British government in India, where because of what was happening in another colony, Hong Kong, and fears that had risen there, they tried to come down with a heavy hand. They did not really consult too much with the Indian elite or the middle classes, which immediately resented the fact that Chafeka brothers, for instance, were middle class. And of course, the poor had no one to whom to turn, and so were fleeing. 
Next slide, please. And so now the question is, since that happened in 1897, 1898, when you had something that was arguably even more exacting in terms of the toll, why didn't the dog bark? Um, and the answers are several. One was the state, having learnt its lesson, intervened less. There was apathy on the part of the public to the state. A number of communities got together and helped themselves. And some of this had been seen with the plague, with the Kojas and uh, uh, people like the Aga Khan and his group. But it happened a great deal more in Bombay. Poor timing. The First World War had just happened. The disease hit rapidly and then in a matter of months was gone, unlike the plague, which lingered for a good long while. There was political expediency. There was the Rowlett Act, which essentially allowed for people to be apprehended and kept away for a long time under what was called the Anarchical and Revolutionary Crimes Act, which would lead largely to the non-cooperation movement about the same time the first of a major set of movements that would eventually result in the British leaving India. And finally, the fact that the disease appeared to have arrived from the West rather than the East. And uh, so this completely subverted the general story of the fact that the, 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 the story that the West brought progress, the East and the East returned the favour with suckling gratitude by giving the West disease. And uh, the fact that this did not play by that script was perhaps not particularly uh, exciting to those that were prosecuting the subject in any shape or form. Next subject, uh, next slide, please. One interesting point, and this is William Leishman of Leishman Isis, Kalaza, uh, is the discussion on the bacteriology of influenza. And this is a key point. The, the pandemic of influenza during 18, 1918 to 1919 served to bring them very forcibly the importance of microbiological knowledge. But there is good reason to believe that severe defeat that suffered by preventive medicine was due in great part to our ignorance with regard to the primary infective agent of this disease. Now, the key thing over here is they're using the word bacteriology because the notion of a virus, uh, such as we understand it today, did not exist. There was the notion of a filterable virus where, said, which, where the idea was that it was smaller than a bacterium, but only it took Robert, uh, Richard Shop uh, another 15 years or so to discover what the virus actually was in this particular case. Next slide, please. Right. We're moving now to another set of responses, and this is what I call religion and its manifestations. Intriguingly, the great influenza did not have the kind of deities that other pandemics evoked. And we saw in our opening slide, Shitala, which is also from the end, and we'll come to it again, uh, who was seen as the goddess of smallpox. And influenza may not have had these because of the generally muted societal reaction that we have noted. Local response was generally rooted in religion. It is worthwhile considering immediate and present day contexts to effectuate comparison. A topical article in the publication The Wire from here in India discusses deities associated with diseases as the live mint at the same time. And this was in late 2020. Title Corona Martha and the Pandemic Goddesses in appearing in September 2020 at the hand of the correspondent Nandini Sen, where a recent invocation of the goddess Corona Martha over the present pandemic draws upon earlier signs of veneration, particularly Shitala Devi for smallpox in Bengal and other parts of North India. We have the next slide, please. And this is it from this is from the NLM again. Um, who herself was a derivation from an earlier belief, oddly enough, in Buddhist circles rather than Hindu, and called Haritha. Next slide, please. And that's Haritha on the left, over here. And we'll stay on the slide for a bit. Shitala's counterpart in South India is called Mariaman, 
and was associated with cholera. Uh, there are variants of the story. Uh, I mean, Maribyrn is now largely associated with but more part than cholera, but it's uh, but but we must remember that uh, Haritha was first associated with cholera, and so these are derivatives. Now there are variants of the story, and by the way, on, on the right over here, this is a Maribyrn temple. And there are variants of the story with diffusion between deities for both smallpox and cholera, like Shatala, where Mariaman is, apart from smallpox, also linked with chickenpox and the plague. And in many of those instances, simply called Ame, particularly in places like Coimbatore in present-day Tamil Nadu, the state of Tamil Nadu, where dead rats were seen as a sign that plague was imminent. Part of a song by Muttu Gounder and Bekta uh, Rama Reddy, both witnesses the plague in Edapadi, in 1916, traces the journey of the plague from Bombay to Bangalore and Salem, and also speaks the hardships faced by the village households. Maybe see the next slide, please. So we have this, right? We also have an account by Kurandayamal, a, a resident of Ka uh, Kalapati Coimbatore, who was not in a team during the plague, the plague of, of the 1940s. And you can actually see this. The plague did not appear in Edapadi, and as a form of warning, the rats fall dead. I remember rats falling down from roofs and dying in our homes. It was the most ominous sight I've ever seen. You might laugh at it today, but a rat falling from the roof meant we had to leave our houses, not knowing when we could return. Right. Uh, more recently, Shatala's role has been repurposed such that she's now the goddess of HIV AIDS, especially given that smallpox has been eradicated. Given that spread of HIV AIDS was perceived as a form of spirit possession, belief in Shitala is seen to be protective of devotees. Smallpox appears to dominate, however, much of the early discourse. The religious studies scholar Perun Devi Srinivasan has described through her compelling paper, Sprouts of the Body, Sprouts of the Field, identification of the goddess with poxes in South India, that when a person is afflicted with poxes of any variety, it is believed the goddess Mariaman has arrived in the person. The Tamil term Ammai means pustules or pearls of poxes, as well as mother or goddess. Within a remarkable collation of narratives from the southern state, Indian state of Kerala, Aitiyamala, a garland of legends that began being published in 1909. Uh, next slide, please. The compiler Koptaratil Shanguni writes the legend of Kodungalarur or Krangano uh, Vasurimala, who is a woman rendered devoid of eyes, ears, and limbs, and who smells her way to those that incur the wrath of her presiding goddess Badrakali, so as to cause them to manifest the disease. Astrologers hold that smallpox is engendered through the displeasure of Chova, the planet Mars, which symbolizes goddess Badrakali. The Indologist Fabrizio Ferrari has studied religious responses to cholera in Bengal and describes the cult around Ola Devi, the flux goddess, worshipped by both Hindu and Muslim devotees. To quote Ferrari, the former calls her Ola Gandhi, the latter refer to her as Ola Bibi. The unique feature of Ola Bibi is that she is Muslim. Devotees wish, worship her as an avatar, avatar, uh, uh, descent of Vishnu Narayan, and more rarely, the consort of Allah. Though this might sound as an oxymoron to some and blasphemy to others, Ola Bibi, affectionately called Bibi Ma, is worshipped by Muslims who find it unpro unproblematic to call her Bibi, and ask her intercession through Pujo, Puja. In Bundelkhand, in central India, the deity was male a rarity in a pantheon of disease-dominating goddesses, and called Hardul Lala, with the disease laid squarely at the door of the British soldiers working under Lord Hastings, sinning through the killing and consumption of cows in a sacred grove associated with Lala, a former prince. Apparently, Hardul Lala had been worshipped for reasons other than disease, but in 1817, his role was amplified to include cholera, resulting in his popularity correspondingly increasing from Calcutta to Lahore. We have been reflecting on such amplification, and have found useful the analogy from evolutionary biology of exaptation or preadaptation, where the primary role of a particular structure is suborned to another, which becomes dominant, for instance, feathers aiding flight, when the original use appeared to be for thermal insulation and therapod dinosaurs, 
the flightless precursors to modern day birds. Whatever Hardulala's merits in earlier invocations, they clearly paled in its popularity against the backdrop of the cold light of cholera. An important consideration is the vantage point of the viewer. In the cases above, many of the deities mentioned preceded the Eurocolonial moment, even if some were accepted to pandemic purposes during it. The nature of description, therefore, would vary from those who wore the colonial lens and employed it anthropologically, it with a certain sympathy, as may be found in the original sense of the term Orientalism, where there was a certain universalizing of that sympathy, and a later one that simply saw the other as other. A significant case in point is omens and superstitions of southern India by the superintendent of the Madras Museum from 1885 to 1908, Edgar Thurston. Next slide, please. Written in 1912, three years after his compendious castes and tribes of southern India with K. Rangachari, and that's his picture on the right. An adherent of sophisticated scientific racialism, he would employ craniometric studies and nasal indices with the aid of vernier calipers, still in evidence in the Madras Museum. And if you look at this, this is the physical uh, anthropology gallery on the, the far left. And um, in this very dusty uh, cabinet, you have the vernier calipers with no legend, except the superintendent showed me, and that's a close up above it. Uh, to, uh, to help identify what he called criminal castes following Bertillon, uh, who had done his work on the subject in France. Omens and superstitions had a number of telling chapters, such as animal superstition, the evil eye, snake worship, and human sacrifice, among others. The evil eye is invoked in the case of Badrakali, who we have seen in Shanguni's work in very anthropological terms. At a ceremony performed in Travancore, when epidemic disease prevails, an image of Badrakali is drawn on the ground with powders of five colours, white, yellowy, black, green and red. At night, songs are sung in praise of that deity by a theotony, someone who belongs to what are known as the other backward classes now, and his followers. A member of the troupe then plays the part of Badrakali in the act of murdering the demon Darika. And in conclusion, waves a torch before the inmates of the house to ward off the evil eye, which is the most important item of the whole ceremony. The torch is believed to be given by Shiva, who is worshipped before the light is waved. Uh, next slide, please. So this is it. And that is what I've just read. And this is Omens and Superstitions by Edgar Thurston. Trenchant points of criticism regarding cultural practice abound in the pages of the Indian Medical Gazette, also found through PubMed uh, on the National Library's page, for which we're very grateful. Now, these points of criticism included, surprisingly, many Indians themselves. The observations of Rai Bahadur Kani Lodhe are a case in point. Next slide, please. And what you can see over here is exactly the Jains are scrupulously tender the treatment of lower animals so far as to feed rats and mice and almost treat them as domestic animals in view of the role which these animals play in epidemics that plague the high mortality among the Jains is a very significant fact and that's an editorial uh, on on the other hand over here you've got Rai Bahadur Khani uh, and he writes how long we are driven to ask will the darkness of ignorance and pertinacity to mis mischievous traditional prejudice stand between other intelligent natives and the dictates of common sense and of humanity? Um, and that's just one of a number of tribes on the subject. Thank you. I would like to end today's talk with a personal reflection. As we try to put the issue of superstition and culture into perspective, when we speak about disease, and in many ways, the unwalled city to death, as the third century BC Greek philosopher Epicurus so eloquently referred to it, as quoted in Laura Spinney's masterful 19, uh, 2017 effort, Pale Rider, the Spanish flu of 1918, and how it changed the world. Many years ago, I was in an unpretentious Chinese restaurant across Hampton Boulevard from Old Dominion University, Norfolk, Virginia. 
where I was reading for a doctorate in ecological sciences. There was only one other customer, Anglo-Saxon, as we used to say about anyone who was white in those days, who smiled at me and I responded in kind. We got to talking. I soon learned that he was an ardent Christian and he asked me from where I hailed. When I said India, he gave me a sidelong look and said, oh, that's where they worship rats, right? While I murmured something defensively, I was smarting at the slight towards my nation. Much later, I would reflect upon that moment again and think about what I would have said to my co-religionist and cultural critic. I realized that I could have replied, oh, you're from the United States, that's where they take up venomous snakes, says Dennis Covington's grip, gripping Salvation at Sand Mountain describes. And I would have quoted book, chapter, and verse with that curious command, in this case, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16 and verse 18. The truth is, both of us would have been right. There is a rat temple, the Karni Mata in Bikaner in Rajasthan. And believers, at their peril, take up venomous snakes in Sand Mountain in southern Appalachia, including parts of Georgia and Tennessee. But trying to score points in this manner is a matter of low-hanging fruit, and in many ways unbecoming of serious exchange. There is a basis to these accounts, and they are, part, they are a part of each nation's heritage, but they cannot stand as a synecdoche for the whole. As we wrestle with issues of rationality and ideology, magic and science, nationalism and devotion, and always history, we could do worse than call to mind the insight of the Nigerian and now American author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, where in a celebrated TED talk in 2009, she spoke about the danger of a single story. As we reflect upon cultural practice, may we remember that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Dr. Matthew, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, really appreciate you taking the time, you and your research team, to uh, compose it so uh, eloquently and uh, visually. So thank you very, very much. We do have a few questions uh, that have come in and um, I'd like to begin. Um, thank you so much for your talk, this individual rights, uh, and thank you for making clear the sheer human impact of epidemic disease in India. This person asks, where are there silences in the archives you have consulted to paint the picture that you have done so very well? Is the history of some regions better preserved and or accessible than the history of others? It's a, it's a very good question. And um, I can immediately say that the archives in Maharashtra, which I have consulted, are good. And uh, also the ones in Tamil Nadu, although access sometimes can be a little harder there, as well as in Kerala, where I've been, and the National Archives in Delhi. Although what's interesting in, in Delhi is the fact that there are two uh, sets of files, one of which is very often inaccessible to regular researchers. So we do have those issues. It's also confessedly easier to work in the colonial period because the records were meticulous. And um, I don't know if this is true for a number of countries that swiftly come to points of decolonization. Well, not that India was swift, but it came to a head pretty quickly after uh, the Second World War. And what happens to the keeping of records? I know that there are some parts of the country where um, in not quite, not Calcutta, but in a neighboring state where files are in tremendous disrepair. 
and that is setting. Um, for many of us doing history in the country, we we recognize that. There has been an effort on the part of institutions now, some private, uh, others governmental, to start an archiving process. That's one aspect of the question. The other is where are there silences? And I think one major silence is about influenza. And this is even during the colonial period. It is telling that we can't find any photographs. And uh, it's I haven't found them in, I mean, the NLM doesn't seem to have any, but uh, I, even in places where there is a very strong, straight colonial connection with India, such as a welcome in in the United Kingdom, there aren't any. And um, And the fact that they do exist for the plague, which was 20 years earlier, is remarkable. So that's one place. Now, the fact is that those numbers, as I mentioned earlier, were discrepant and uh, 50 to 100 percent. And very often, just like with HIV AIDS, you have people dying of secondary infections like pneumonia. And so the question is, what is what eventually was the, the final cause of death? And it may not always be put down as the flu, uh, but there is that. But even in the face of that, this this lack of a visual representation is stunning. Thank you. Another question, I should remind uh, those who are watching, uh, there is a live feedback button underneath your uh, video stream, and you can use that button to send questions to Dr. Matthew uh, through me. Pardon me for not mentioning that in the first instance, I should have done so. Um, the other, another question that has come in, um, how do the religious and or superstitious responses you describe factor in memories of epidemic disease passed down within individual Indian families? Are there specific examples of which you or your research team might be familiar and could share? We were, we were speaking about this, and some of these were actually referred to in the poetry that, that did come through, and there were and those were instances that were being picked up. And you, for instance, if you take the uh, the place of Mariam, and, and this is interesting, right, where you had this between religions from Buddhism, Haritha, and you had cholera coming to Hinduism and then being used as sm smallpox. And what we found interesting as a team was, I mean, and we used the biological idea of exaptation, where you said, where you where you, you may have a particular role, but suddenly a disease comes along and so you can just repurpose the deity for something else. And But there are, uh, especially in the case of Coimbatore, we have these these temples for Mariamen, for example, which do exist, and those are very strong community elements. And so the tradition there is important in many ways, and the fact that diseases come quite so often gives the gods plenty to do, so to speak. So the answer is yes, there, there, there is that. There is certainly that, that story that comes through in memoirs and it comes through in community practice. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question that's come in uh, is a, a, a praise of the diversity of your teaching experience is truly impressive, this person writes. Could you speak to how, if at all, does the history of epidemic disease or perhaps more broadly public health figure in the curriculum of primary or secondary Indian schools, given the diversity of the country, with respect to the diversity of the country? Sorry. Sadly, little. And, uh, and, and it's, it's a great question. Um, the, que the issue is, does it, really factor in many school curricula universally. And I don't know that it necessarily does. I mean, I'm when you think about, let's just take it from a historical perspective, and you say there are political causes, there are economic causes, but how often do we see curricula hang on the nail 
of public health. And it's, uh, why does that not become the point of departure in many ways? To why, as I, I mentioned Laura Spinney today, uh, playwright, and you know her, you've met her too at the same conference that we, or we attended. And, and Laura wrote to me a few weeks ago and said, I'm seeing curricula come out these days, and they're already forgetting about the Spanish flu again. And that was telling. I mean, we, we aren't even done with COVID-19. And the fact that there, there's this almost coerced amnesia that, that people, with which people are comfortable, I mean, at least the creators of curricula, is something of an indictment. And I think that that when that occurs in the face of something as utterly crippling as what we've encountered in recent times, then it seems very unlikely that school curricula will be in the vanguard of foisting that change. Thank you. And yes, indeed, both of us had the privilege of meeting uh, Laura at uh, the conference in Yip in Belgium uh, in early 2019. And uh, I failed to mention this to you before uh, your talk today, but I had dinner just last night with uh, Dominic Dendoven, uh, who sent really? his regards. Yes, uh, uh, he was passing, passing through town uh, on, on, uh, 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 on work, on research, and uh, giving a talk here locally. So uh, we send him our regards. And I told him that we would have the privilege of hosting you for your talk today. So, so. Small, small uh, world. It really um, is. Thank you. Thank yes, you very much. of course. Um, another question that has come in, uh, how would you compare the trajectory of the SARS COVID-2 COVID pandemic in the first two years in India compared to uh, first the rest of Asia and secondly to the rest of the world? If there were significant differences, what might have caused them? What was interesting about India was that it seemed to be very class oriented to begin with. Um, and it's interesting that you asked because we did have certain places were hit very hard early, like South Korea, for example, and uh, Spain and Italy and Europe. And, and like with HIV, the AIDS, there were all of these statements around the country that India wasn't contracting it because we were physically more capable of dealing with the situation. Part of it was because apparently Indians were more used to difficult circumstances and sanitary terms and so could cope better. Now this is this is this was very quickly dispelled. Now, but what was interesting? was if we do actually accept two waves and is that when it really did start hitting and this was true already by April I mean and before that there'd been a big rally involving the prime minister and that was and that was largely seen as the statement of well COVID really isn't our problem it's happening elsewhere um well, by April, we had these lockdowns and they were very draconian. And the people that they affected were those that were poor, which is why we had the guest worker situation. Many people were traveling long distances, particularly from the north to the south of India, and they were all trying to get home. And I know this because many of us were trying to help. And, uh, and the picture that you saw earlier of people being put on a lorry was something that I took. And they had walked 70 to 80 kilometers and been brought back. But, but the difference here was that it hadn't got through this metaphorical cordon sanitaire in some senses. So the people that were affluent could still go to private hospitals, which, which were beyond the ken of those that were guest workers, the migrant workers. So it was seen very much as something that affected the less privileged. The second wave busted that. And that was a moment when 
everyone was hit. Uh, and there, even for those that could afford it, oxygen wasn't immediately available. And there were no hospital beds. Private hospitals were also being overrun. And so I would really make the stark point of difference between the first wave and the second wave in this particular regard, as far as India internally is concerned. But the first, uh, India was a little slower off, uh, off the mark, so to speak, at that point in time. But And with the lockdowns, I think we all were holding our breath saying, are we merely delaying the inevitable? And uh, part of the issue then was that we didn't know how long it could last without our taking an immediate a massive economic hit. Uh, and that's what eventually led to, after lockdown four, we had unlock one and the like. So, yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, you describe the significance of the Chapakar Memorial. Um, how mm -hmm. prevalent, if at all, are other physical, similar physical markers on the Indian landscape? or rather more broadly, memorials associated with the regional, with regional or national histories of uh, epidemic disease in India? Um, there aren't really many memorials to disease as much. That could be. In fact, even this one isn't a memorial to disease. It happens that they kill the plague commissioner. So it's a and it's not like, and yes, he was prosecuting his duties and and was, as I said, extremely zealous about them. But it's not like something you would find uh, in Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, for example, where you would have a memorial to deaths due to epilepsy, or even in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. So, no, I can't really think of memorials to to great, I mean, in terms of great epidemic losses, I mean, uh, Tumbe makes the point that cemeteries hold a number of graves of people who died around the same time, and that is its own particular marker, but that's an outcome of what happened at that point in time, rather than a decided, sedulous effort to say we shall remember. So, yeah perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Matthew, thank you very, very much for your talk this afternoon, which is, of course, your evening late for you. Uh, and we are very grateful, uh, all of us at the National Library of Medicine, for your time. And again, that of your, your fantastic research team. I'm so happy that you, you included the slide with their faces and their names. Uh, and uh, certainly, if my colleagues and I can be a further service to you uh, in your research using our resources and perhaps others, uh, in cooperation with others uh, and across the library and archives world, uh, please be in touch, and we will keep in touch. And uh, thank you again very, very much for your, your thought-provoking presentation. Very, very grateful. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Resnick. Please know how grateful we are in turn to bring our stories to you as well. And uh, thank you. And thank you for your graciousness and your hospitality. Thank you so much to Ms. Lindsay Franz as well and everybody on your team and always onwards, and know that you have friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthew.